Okay. Let's start. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa. Annyeonghaseyo. And hello, all. Welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 120th seminar, and I call it a Yale Day. Last month, I had four trips with a total of two weeks out of town to give invited talks and attend conferences and workshops. Since January, I have given 10 talks for 30 days out of town, meaning one third of the time traveling. In April, I have four more talks to give out of town for 11 days, including my second international trip this year to France. In this rate, I will probably be traveling for more than 150 days again this year, including my six to eight weeks of nonstop trip in this summer. Why I am I traveling too many years, too many days? Well, online seminars such as our Simbis cities can give a free education opportunity to the global community, but we cannot experience real time human interactions such as having dinner together and drinking beer or wine together. The pandemic has changed how we interact with others, but I believe strongly that such human interactions cannot be replaced by virtual communications. During the pandemic, we lost many people, but more importantly, we lost such human interactions to regain the lost ones I have traveled for more than 310 days in 2022 and 2023 alone, and I will continue to do so this year. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly, that might be very challenging, uh, our pioneer speaker, Professor Ferran Isaac. He does not need any introduction because we all know him. He is a professor at Yale University. He and I have known each other for more than a decade, but I guess the last time when we met in person was 2017 when he invited me to give a talk at the Synthetic Biology Gordon Research Conference he organized at the time. He was one of the conference chairs with Victor, I think, Pinheiro, another Simbis pioneer speaker. I still remember that conference because it was the, the first time when I had beer with Jim Collins, Andy Ellington, and other big name people in a near bar, not on conference reception, or MIT reception, discussing many interesting topics. Ferran, thanks so much for your scientific contribution, including one of the first biocontainment technologies and genome-wide codon, uh, codon engineering, as well as your service as a chair of the unforgettable GRC conference and as a com committee member of upcoming Simbis conference in Hawaii, helping me organize it, the virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Taesuk. Um, Really appreciate your introduction, but even more so your hosting this, this seminar series. Uh, and I'm long overdue for participating, so thank you for, for inviting me today, uh, alongside George, uh, my academic brother. And so I will just speak for a few minutes um, using Taesuk's guidance um, to just sort of briefly introduce my science, as well as my own personal story, 
uh, talk a little bit about some things I'm excited about today, and I'll close with some sort of like um, inspirational quotes and nuggets of advice. And so um, broadly, my lab is takes an approach of biologically inspired engineering to probe, program, and recode organisms. Um, like many people uh, who are, are attending this or those who might be interested in synthetic biology, I've had a real passion for the field, for biology, and its interface uh, with technology, recognizing actually that biology is the most powerful technology that we have. Um, it's allowing us to really transform the way that we make medicines, foods, energy, chemicals, and materials. Um, and much of this um, really requires the, the field of synthetic biology or the engineering of, engineering of biology to achieve uh, the, the, these um, great goals. And I think what's exciting to me is um, really working at the interface of biology, engineering, chemistry, mathematics, and physics to really push the envelope of what we can actually make with biology. And along the way, use these same approaches um, and approaches rooted in engineering to really enhance our understanding of biological systems. Um, before I, I, I talk, I'll just sort of give a quick sort of uh, one slide um, uh, story of sort of my journey through life and, and science. I was born in South Africa, my family moved to San Francisco when I was young, and then again to Phoenix, Arizona, where I grew up between San Francisco and Phoenix. Um, I attended high school in Phoenix, Arizona, large inner city public school. Um, and I uh, used some of my time there to volunteer in a neuro-oncology lab, which gave me my first um, research experience um, where I was really um, uh, hooked on really all things uh, in, in in science. And I really, at that point, developed a passion in math, biology, chemistry, physics, and engineering. Um, and that really guided, you know, what I did as an undergraduate where I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I've always been interested in, in science and engineering, but really with a mindset to solve real world problems, which is really why I pursued bioengineering. And I started off actually studying um, business as well. Penn has this really interesting program in management technology. I was also pre-med. I ended up uh, getting a degree in bioengineering and doing a lot of research along the way, both in my hometown at Barrow Neurological Institute, as well as at Penn in various neurosurgery and neurotrauma labs. Um, that then motivated my next step where I went to do my PhD in biomedical engineering um, at Boston University. Uh, where I was fortunate to, to land as a joint mentored by Jim Collins and Charles Cantor, where we really helped launch the modern day field of synthetic biology. I was able to get involved in some early research there. And then um, met George Church towards the end of my PhD and uh, was fortunate to have an opportunity to work with him as a postdoc in genetics and genomics and more broadly molecular technologies, which really collectively provide me the foundation ultimately to launch my lab at Yale about 14 years ago, um, where I've been running a lab in bioengineering, synthetic biology, genomics, as well as teaching courses in molecular biology and biotechnology. Um, along the way, I was trained as an EMT, spent a lot of time in, in medicine in the clinic because of my interests early on in medicine. I even did stints in McKinsey, as management consulting and biotech startups, which I'm continually involved in today. Um, what I would say, all of these experiences really shaped me in particular, being able to work uh, with inspirational mentors, I think was um, incredibly important in shaping my interests, challenging me to ask challenging and important questions um, and developing creative solutions. And so I really, owe a lot to my to my mentors um, in, in sort of establishing that foundation for me. And I've tried to use this really as uh, a way to sort of structure the research in my lab, both internally and through collaborations, where um, I really uh, partner with each person in my lab and have them, um, you know, champion a project that they're passionate about. Because um, I find that that has been critical in leading to success in, in my own projects and those of, of prior people in the lab. So I'm 
thankful for all the people who are in my lab, who've previously been in my lab, as well as a, a, a list of, of collaborators who we're currently working with today. Um, just the, 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 the topic of genomics has always been fascinating to me, really trying, trying to understand um, the genetic basis of species diversity. Uh, obviously, over the past 20, 25 years, we've seen tremendous advances in the reading or sequencing of, of genomes, which we'll hear a lot more about from George in a few minutes. Um, but that really has given us a much deeper understanding of genetic variants are associated with certain phenotypes of diseases, and it's really transformed the law of life science research that many of you are familiar with. It's also motivated this quest to write genomes, right? The complement to the reading of genomes, to first test a lot of the hypotheses that are coming from the sequencing data sets. Um, we can use these technologies, right, in the clinic to treat diseases, and we're actually seeing um, now the transition of these technologies to the clinic, right? Just a few months ago, we saw the first um, approval of a CRISPR-based gene therapy. Um, and us and, and many others are really using these technologies to engineer synthetic biological systems. And so at the heart of my lab, um, many projects are really rooted in further developing genome and biomolecular technologies for a wide array of, 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 of um, questions or applications, one of which is really to drive towards a much deeper causal understanding of genetic variation, as I was just mentioned in the last slide. We've also developed a lot of interest in being able to engineer biosynthetic pathways, um, and in particular, motivated by trying to understand a lot of the biosynthetic pa pathways um, associated with secondary metabolism and natural products that are largely unexplored, but are a really interesting area of research. And that's something that my lab has jumped into over the past few years. And we have a longstanding interest, dating back to my postdoc with George Church, in the design and construction of genomically recorded organisms, where we've been able to develop novel solutions for biological safeguards, as well as applying that to the field of the genetic code expansion to basically produce new kinds of proteins, polymers, and materials with um, uh, expanded synthetic chemistries. I'll just briefly sort of introduce what I mean by a genomically recorded organisms. Basically, the natural genetic code is shown there on the left. Uh, it's largely conserved across all domains of life, and it also has inherent redundancy of degeneracy. You've got 64 codons that code for 21 functions, the 20 natural amino acids in stock. And so what I've been really fascinated uh, for over 15 years now is can we actually construct organisms with alternative or new genetic codes as shown on the right? And what I mean by that is if you consider, for example, all codons that I just highlighted there in blue that are responsible for arginine, could you effectively eliminate some of those to construct a genetic code with 62 codons rather than 64? And so this is something that <clears throat> my lab has been, been interested in ever since we started. And again, getting back to a project that I launched when I was with George to really use this technology to expand biological function. And it's been a great area of research because it's been able to really motivate um, the development of advanced genome engineering technologies. We've used this to create new kinds of synthetic proteins, polymers, and materials, new solutions for biocontainment, uh, as well as new solutions for genetic isolation. I won't talk about all these things. I'll just sort of pick one topic that I find really interesting today, which is this really interesting um, milestone in, in human history where over the past few years, human-made materials now outweigh all life on Earth, which is a really amazing statistic. There's that paper from Ron Milo's paper a few years ago that actually um, mapped all of this. And so question that we and others are asking is, will we be better off when the next 1.1 trillion tons of material is made by synthetic biology? Um, and when you think about materials and you think about biology, biology, can make all sorts of really cool molecules, small molecules, uh, protein polymers, lipids, carbohydrates. If you think about proteins or polymers, um, you can um, make a whole host of really uh, powerful proteins or enzymes, but there's a whole suite of materials that we use in, in society today, such as the ones I'm showing you over here, fabrics and nylons, et cetera, that you actually can't make in biological systems because of the limits to the chemistry of the 20 natural amino acids. And so this vision that we've been really trying to champion over the past decade or so 
uh, is can we make novel biomaterials that unite the precision of biology, the diversity of the chemical world that are enabled by genomically recoded organisms? What I mean by biology-based synthesis, right? Everything in biology is genetically encoded and template directed in, in, in our genes. And you think about proteins, right? Um, all proteins are very complex and evolved for a very defined biological function. And the chemistry is limited to 20 amino acids. Um, but you have monomeric control over every amino acid you place in that protein because it's genetically encoded. When you think about the chemical world, you have this unlimited um, access to chemical diversity from that periodic table. But the polymers that you make in test tubes cannot be achieved in a template directed manner. And so there's this really exciting opportunity to like really bring these two worlds together under one roof to be able to actually use recoded organisms, engineer translation machineries and ribosomes to create novel proteins and polymers and biomaterials with a whole host of new chemistries. And this is something that my lab has really been excited about developing over the past 10 years. To give you one example of a material that we've made um, is we've used a recoded organism where we've created a, a, a biomaterial where we drive multi-site incorporation of a synthetic amino acid shown here in red, and we attach fatty acids or lipids with the goal of creating a new kind of a biotherapeutic that where we can finally tune its half-life by um, engineering its binding affinity to human serum albumin, um, which is the most abundant protein in serum and has a half-life of three weeks. Here's actually a study that one of my former uh, PhD students, Kuhn Vanishern, published a few years ago in collaboration with Mira Amaram, a former postdoc, and Mark Saltzman in biomedical engineering here at Yale, is we basically engineered a suite of biopolymers that have tunable half-lives. And this is something that we think is really a lot of great utility for biotherapeutics. And in part, some of this technology has been licensed to a, a company that we spun out a few years ago that's seeking to advance these uh, towards developing novel therapeutics in the clinic. So what you can see is um, a lot of the work that we do has some basic fundamental components and questions, but with an eye towards solving real world problems that in this case impact uh, medicine and therapeutics and can improve patient lives, but more broadly across society that I don't have time to talk about today. I'll just close, um, so uh, inspired by, by Tysuk's guidance here to share just a few inspirational quotes that um, uh, I, I have guided me and I, I, I've shared with my lab over the years. Definitely always follow your passion. Always know why you're doing what you're doing because you want to really be motivated. Be fearless when you do your work. And tied to that is ask bold, challenging questions and don't be afraid to take risks. Um, and embrace and learn from failure. Many of you are used to succeeding at the highest levels, but not until you push yourself to failing. Um, I think do you gain a deep understanding and really push the boundary, boundaries of what's achievable. Now, when you fail, you wanna fail fast, right? Um, and th this next quote comes from, comes from George. When it doesn't work as we expect, we'll learn something about the biology. And I can attest to that a number of times in, in lots of projects I've been working on. Um, and the other thing about, about science is, you know, it's, it's not done in isolation. What makes science fun and exciting is by working with others and collaborating. And that's been a really critical part of my journey through science. Um, and as you can see, really work on problems that can impact and improve uh, the lives of others. And then finally, leave some bandwidth, which is hard to be able to think creatively, um, explore broadly and, and dream big. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm happy to, to pass the baton to George, who's actually going to talk about some cool science. And it's a pleasure to to join everyone today. Thanks, Tyson. Oh, absolutely beautiful. You know, uh, you know, the your last slide I should just print out and then put in under my wall. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the absolute I try to do right now. And and as you mentioned, your trajectory of your career is absolutely, you know, 
basically talent kind of program, I believe, because I know you pen manager management plus whatever you know, engineering and uh that program is very unique, very competitive because my daughter, I mean friend actually tried to get in but never <laughs> never successful. And then interesting your journey from South Africa now in US. That's a very interesting journey. I never you know knew about that one. Uh, even though I know you for more than a decade. And then I absolutely agree with you. You being all the way to top career, but you know, we learn from failure. Absolutely. And then I wanted to emphasize one more time. Fail and then learn from failure. And then never afraid of you know taking risk and never give up. And then dream high, and then I believe that is quality of the older leaders. I believe so, absolutely brilliant. And then personally, I love your work. So my your bio containment paper NAR many 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 years ago. That's a mandatory reading for all my students. And I use your paper about codon engineering, and I use that all for my lecture for more than ten years. So. Absolutely, thank you for what you've done to the community. Your amazing, you know, quote and advice. And thank you so much again. Thank you, Tesuk. That's very kind of you. And I, I share similar sentiments about you and your work. Thank you so much. All right. So now, the main speaker of today, with our longer introduction, Dr. Georgie Chow. Don't confuse, uh, don't be confused, you know, with the George Church. Uh, is a postdoc currently working in Dr. George Church lab at Harvard Medical School. During his undergraduate years at the University of Minnesota, where he majored in genetics and computer science, he became captivated by the concept of making biology programmable. This fascination evolved into a tangible passion as George lead, led the University of Minnesota IGM team in 2012, exploring the engineering of microbes for pharmaceutical synthesis. His journey continued at the Health Science and Technology PhD program conducted jointly with Harvard and MIT, another very competitive program where he performed research within the church lab. Here he embarked on a quest with his colleagues to, important is his colleagues, this collaboration, you know, Farron already emphasized, to develop novel technology to program desired behaviors within human cells by leveraging membrane protein engineering and recombinase-based genetic circuits. George has received recognition for his work, including co-writing and securing a DAPA grant, which fueled multiple first author publications. After defending his PhD, George has remained at the church lab for the time being while actively charting his future within academia. I may need to say today is George or George Church Day rather than Yale Day because Farren is also church lab alum. I mean, Dr. George Chow's academic big brother. So George, uh, thank you so much for your time today. And please take it away. It's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Taesok, and thank you, Byron, for sharing your story and for sharing what you're doing in your lab. I actually didn't know how many similarities we had. Um, and um, just also like kind of expanding on what you said about George, what one thing he doesn't lack is a lot of very wise quotes. And um, one thing he, he likes to say is that if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And sure. that, that is that is definitely a motto that the church lab abides by. Um, <clears throat> I also love seeing Felix Radford in your little picture. He's he's here with us now. And um and hopefully I can join that list on the right of collaborators in the near future. 
Okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I am really excited to tell you a bit um, about some uh, a methods development story that we've been just thinking a lot and really excited about recently, which we hope by sharing it with you guys that um, it would be useful for uh, you in the audience. So um, starting off with a little TV style, commercial style teaser, um, but what you can expect to see today is how you can go from the sparse short read coverage of integration junctions that you currently get with whole genome sequencing to the long read high coverage junctions with the addition of just one extra input. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my research interests, although Taysok did a great job in, uh, introducing a lot of that already. I want to convince you that you're interested in figuring out where your genes are going when you're doing genome engineering. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what methods there that are already in existence to do this, um, and then about the technology we've developed, which combines two what I consider really exciting and cutting-edge technologies, segmentation, PCR, and nanopore sequencing, um, to do this in a fast and easy and affordable way. Um, and then, you know, long read sequencing is a pretty new technology and the type of data you get from it, um, it's also pretty new. So we're, I'm going to share a little bit about how we uh, build our downstream analysis pipeline for that long read sequencing data. And then I'll conclude uh, with some general summaries and uh, take some questions. Okay, so a little bit about my interests actually mirrors uh, Farron quite a bit. Um, in that I uh, was doing my genetics computer science a degree in University of Minnesota, and that's where I really got interested in the idea of programming and you know uh, engineering biology for real world applications. And then I came here to Harvard and MIT and did my PhD with the lab of Dr. George Church, where I'm still at um, working on finishing up my projects, publishing them. <clears throat> and so speaking with this uh, synthetic biology audience, I'm sure all of you know that synthetic biology is a broadly defined field with people working on a range of topics from global warming to uh, like ferrons doing uh, material science and into uh, cancer immunotherapies. Um, so my own personal interest in this space is to engineer biologically inspired technologies in human cell. And what I mean in my case for biologically inspired is uh, general genes and principles that already exist within the biological space. But um, we want to take these out of those contexts and create levers and control mechanisms that allow us to tune these phenomena. And primarily for the applications of rapidly engineering and characterizing human cell lines, and then controlling expanding natural cell capabilities for applications such as tissue engineering and cell therapy. <clears throat> and so some of the uh, work that I've done in that area includes the engineering of this programmable cell cell adhesion protein platform called Helix Camps. Helix Camps are uh, surface mounted coil coils that can impart differential affinity to the cells. And co co coil coils are well known protein domains that are easy to engineer. So you can easily expand the set of Helix Camps. We demonstrate that by using a set of five pairs of Helix Camps, we can create really complex uh, layered cellular structures. And by uh, pre patterning surfaces with uh, coil coils, you can then subsequently pattern Helix Camp cells onto it simultaneously. And then on the flip side, um, for gene expression and cell line construction, um, we I work most workly on recombinant site-specific recombinants. So these are proteins that are phage derived and capable of catalyzing large DNA rearrangements. And so by this capability allows you to both use these recombinants to integrate large genetic cassettes into either landing pads or pseudocytes within the human genome, but then also use these recombinants to control the expression of genes. So we uh, have. Um, what, in our previous work, we designed and validated a differential equations model for expression, binding, and catalysis of uh, large serine integrases. And we demonstrated that by using our model, you can start to understand the finite changes to this protein, to these recombinases, by doing uh, point uh, amino acid mutations. And so uh, leading off from, from this work, um, I'll be talking a bit today um, about uh, characterizing genetic integrations. So you know, as all of you know, everyone seems to be doing genome editing these days. Um, there are uh, two broad classes of genome editing technologies. One group, I would say, is our highly efficient random integration methods that uses things like lentiviruses or trans transposon-based technologies. And then a second set of rapidly developing technologies uh, uses site-specific methods, uh, such as Cas9, um, cutting followed by homologous recombination, 
um, prime editing uh, from David Liu's lab, uh, paste from uh, the Apple Good lab. You can uh, pre-install a landing pad and then use highly efficient and specific recombinators such as PXP1 and the PA01, et cetera, systems from uh, Patrick Sue's recent paper. And then uh, so you can also directly target pseudocytes uh, on the genome using recombinators with ones with known pseudocytes such as PC31, DN29, et cetera. And so um, all of these methods um, are, none of these methods are perfect, of course. Uh, lentiviruses, for instance, are, are known to have over 800 integration sites in the human genome. And the piggyback transposon uses a small TTAA canonical site, which then theoretically allows it to integrate at 7.8 million different possible places on the gene. Even, and even ca these Cas9-directed methods can have off-targets, which is very highly dependent on, guide, on the guide RNA and PAM of the Cas9. Uh, some guide RNAs can have even up to hundreds of off-targets on the genome. Um, but why do you care where your genes go? Well, I think, well, you should, because uh, here are two published instances of why. On the left, George Daly's lab used a lentiviral approach to deliver either five or seven transcription factors into human iPSC cells to derive them into homeropoietic stem and progenitor cell types. However, you can see that in each of their methods, they see a wide variant ration of outcomes from 0% engraftment after, in, uh, after injection into mouse bone marrow to up to 28% engraftment, which is a huge difference. Um, on the right, um, the uh, Nagy lab used the piggyback to uh, reprogram fibroblasts to iPSCs by delivering the Yamanaka factors and inducing expression with doxycycline. And similarly, if you look at day 20, in the 1.5 microgram per mil condition, you see a large range of the number of colonies that are formed after induction. And so we believe that uh, a big contributor to this observed variance is the difference in the integration number and the location of these transgene cassettes. Of course, we ourselves are doing uh, gene editing, uh, genome engineering, and we are trying to build some monoclonal landing pads uh, that express M cherry using the old school method of uh, transfecting human K562 cells with RNPs, uh, Cas9 RNPs targeting the AABS1 site and uh, co-transfecting a donor DNA plasmid. And so the, the way we're doing this is we're doing this delivery with lipofectomy. Um, now we have this heterogeneous population of cells, which we then first screen by uh, putting them through promycin resistant uh, selection. Then ideally only uh, positive integrants are left. And after that we do mono, uh, single cell sorting into 96 well plates and let them grow back out to create monoclonal lines. And uh, we were surprised that when we were screening our clonal lines, we, we expected to see like one to three different variations based on the number of integrants into our on-target lo locus. But instead, we really saw a wide range of different fluorescent expression in our monoclonal lines, which, uh, and you can see here from the scatter that it really varies from like barely visibly red to extraordinarily red. And this led us to ask the question, well, if they're being integrated and they're not be, then, you know, there's such a wide variance, where are they going other than the intended locus? So we looked into the literature to see how people are characterizing into target integrations, expecting to find a simple method that we can quickly do to figure this out. And it turns out that all of the methods that are currently available are really a lot harder than it should be for um, how often people make cell lines in lab these days. Um, so I'm going to remove the uh, citations uh, for the visual clarity, but feel free to look back at the recording if you want to look into any of these methods yourself. But I'll talk through them briefly. Uh, the first group, the simplest approach, which everyone should be doing to every single line that they build, um, is junction PCR, which uh, simply uses plain PCR, uh, primers against the where you expect it to integrate and your insert DNA, and um, you can use Sanger sequencing to validate that you got your on-target integration. But of course, um, this while this method requires minimal cost and effort, it does require you to already know where these integrations are going. So to figure out where to we, it's where it's going that you're not expecting, uh, the, the obvious approach is to just send your samples to your favorite sequencing company along with a pile of cash and let them do whole genome sequencing. And while this approach definitely works once you pay enough money, um, it has a huge downside of being very cost inefficient. Um, mostly, most of your sequencing is going to be on DNA that you don't care about, 
and it's low sensitivity, it has a number of challenges that makes it incompatible with most integration methods because it's uh, short read whole genome sequencing has trouble resolving uh, repetitive insertion regions, um, re um, repetitive insertions themselves, or even sequencing through long homology arms that are greater than the 300 base pair uh, read length. And this, these a lot of these challenges still are there even with uh, paired end sequence methods. And so moving on to this enrichment-based approach, um, they're actually really cool in that they physically pull out the sequences that you're interested in. So one such approach uses a biotinylated deactivated Cas9, which you can then um, attach to your DNA, treat with your DNA with it, and then uh, pull these, your DNA out with uh, uh, streptavidin beads. And another approach called nano OTS for off-target sequencing, you can dis uh, dephosphorylate your DNA fragments and then use Cas9 um, outside of X cell free to cut your D the DNA insights that you're interested in. And then that creates new phosphate and uh, phosphate ends, phosphorylated ends that you can then use to adapt uh, attach sequencing uh, adapters. Uh, these approaches are really cool and compatible with long resequencing and definitely useful for many applications, but they do require a very high amount of input DNA. Uh, which makes them a little more challenging in the clinic, and then have a and do have a cap on how much enrichment you can achieve. Um, and then so finally, uh, I want to talk. Uh, what I'll, I'll mostly focus my talk on today is are this is this group of semi what I call semi targeted amplification approaches. They generally use a similar concept of adding a known DNA handle sequence that flanks the unknown genomic region, so leading to your uh, having known sequences on both ends of this integrated genomic locus that can be then amplified by PCR. And so uh, for instance, uh, the, the older methods in, involve include like inverse PCR, which the cell ligates the fragments uh, or anchor multiplex PCR, which then uh, ligates a known sequence on the flanks. But both of these methods uh, have low sensitivity and require this additional ligation step. And that ligation step can actually um, introduce new junctions making uh, your sequencing data perhaps less uh, uh, useful than you'd expect. Um, a, more, a set of more recent methods, such as GuideSeq and GIS-Seq, which is derived from GuideSeq, incorporates known sequences inside the cell through the NHEJ method um, by, to, to validate breakage points. However, both of these approaches are really meant to characterize the specificity of the editing tools themselves, rather than the cell lines that you're creating from them. Um, so then finally, I want to talk about this method called UDITAS, a really cool approach developed by the biotech company Editas that uses a tagmentation-based approach to insert known DNA followed by PCR. Um, this method is very powerful, but uh, as it stands, requires you to supply a number of your own reagents, such as building your own trans TN5 transposon complexes, and still has a short read sequencing-based readout. So, if we were to develop a method for characterizing integration loci, um, what we our wish list for would be that it would be easy, that it would be affordable, and that it provides long reads so that you can characterize it within repetitive regions and complex regions. So within that first category of easy and affordable, uh, that tech, that UDITAS method, tagmentation PCR sequencing, really does start to get at that um, function. And then uh, in terms of being affordable and long reads, um, the method we're familiar with, it most familiar with now for sequencing. So I'll, I'll, talk, I'll briefly talk you through each of these methods in depth, a little more in depth. So for those of you who aren't familiar with nanopore sequencing, essentially you dock a helicase bound uh, DNA strand frag, uh, molecule onto a pore. And uh, the helicase uh, spools one strand of the DNA through a pore which then creates differential electrical signals um, that then can be converted into bases. And the, this machine is uh, small as a flash drive. It can be plugged into your laptop, desktop computer, right on your bench, and you can sequence it right there. And it provides a really cool real-time output, as you can see here, each of the glowing pores, uh, green dots indicate a dot that's a sequencing, and then blue dots indicate dots that are recovering after having sequenced the fragment of DNA. And so this this is a really and so you can get uh, a very high amount of real time DNA sequencing um, information, and uh, and you can do it all on your own and get the data within within minutes. The cost of this um, in, includes uh, getting the prep kit, which is required for this to work, 
And right now it costs about six ninety nine uh, for a prep kit that preps about ten samples, so about sixty nine dollars per sample. And then the flow cells, which uh, Nanopore re Oxford Nanopore recently dropped the price to about seven hundred dollars each. Um, and then uh, the required equipment just really Im includes uh, this dongle that, that comes with a pack if you buy a pack of six flow cells and your own PC. So this is really within the reach of your of any any lab out there. Um, and so the, the one thing I really like about Oxford Nanopore sequencing is that they they um they provide a wide range of uh, robust prep kits, which really uh, extends the versatility of this method. And one such prep kit is called the Rapid PCR Barcoding Kit. It's a long, uh, a bit of a mouthful. And the way it works is that it uses uh, transposons to uh, add, attach these red DNA sequences into your DNA fragments. And then it subsequently you PCR your uh, tagmented DNA with a, a labeled uh, for single primer, which primes both sides of these fragments and creates amplicons. And then you can treat these these uh, labeled fragments then with the sequencing adapter. And um, you then and that now your library is ready to be put onto a flow cell. And the hands-on time, as you can see on the left, for this entire process only takes about fifteen minutes. Which is really incredible, um, and really straightforward. And there's very few places to make mistakes, which is very important. Um, and so this is what the kit that comes with looks like. It's very simple. There's a fragmentation mix. There's a the adapter mix, and then there's a sequencing buffer. And that's all that you need to get this to work. And and uh, conveniently, uh, Oxford Nanopore also provides without you asking, um, twenty four barcodes for you to um, do. To, to barcode your sequences with. And this is going to be important downstream for when we try to push the cost down for this experiment. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about the tagmentation PCR sequencing method from Editas called Uditas that I mentioned earlier. Um, and you'll see why in a second. The, this, this method uses, takes, it also starts with genomic DNA from edited cells. You tagment the DNA using transposons to insert the handle sequences. And then you use the Illumina primers to attach uh, to attach the adapters, and then you you do uh, sequencing using the Illumina platform. Um, you might kind of you might already so if if we put these two methods side by side, you might already see some similarities between the two. They both start with the tagmentation step. Uh, with Uditas, you use two primers. With the rapid PCR barcoding kit, you just do one primer and amplify whole genome. You add an adapter, and then you either do short resequencing with Uditas or long resequencing with the Nanopore kit. So with these two methods in mind, we we you there's a lot of similarities between them. So we just thought, wouldn't it be possible to make the rapid PCR barcoding kit do long read Uditas by simply adding a reverse primer? And so um, that's exactly what we tried. So on the left, um, I want to sh show you how we're representing some of this data. Um, this is just uh, sequencing using whole genome sequencing unbiased nanopore on a nanopore kit. And so this one yielded three gigabases, so, so about one X human genome. And uh, it, um, and you can see that with the um, control single copy um, genes, we see uh, genes one, for instance, we see, we observe one copy, the uh, AABS1 region, which is chromosome 19, we observe one copy. Beta actin is known to have multiple copies in genome. We observe about 45 reads that maps to that region um, and then for our insert DNA, we observe about 18 uh, reads that map to our insert. So this is what normally what would we expect with whole genome sequencing. Uh, when we do uh, when we add a reverse primer and do a one to one ratio, um, what we observe uh, and notice that this sequencing run yielded much more DNA, 18.6 gigabases, and so we we observe more of the control copies such as genes one. We we observe six reads instead this time for a 10x coverage. Uh, beta actin, we observed 190 copies. And for our insert DNA, we observed only 34 uh, reads. And so if you scale uh, the number of reads to the total number of reads um, in that run, you, you can see that actually our, um, our method performs worse than if you had just done an unbiased whole genome sequencing in the first place. And so as uh, Farron and Taysok mentioned earlier, you gotta fail to succeed, and so at at this point, um, we 
um, where we were thinking, what can we do to make this work better? And um, we were lucky to have a graduate student join our lab, Esther, who um, uh, had a lot of experience with UGITAS. And in some, with, with some discussions with her, uh, we realized that there is actually a number of parameters that we aren't really thinking through about this very complex process. If you think about what's happening in this pool of DNA for the tagmentation PCR, what's really happening is that the tagmentation adds a certain number of uh, transposon sites, um, which the primer then recognizes. And, um, and our eventual goal is to compete against this, uh, what we call random to random, um, random to random uh, amplicon with our target to random amplicon. And so we're competing against these same end amplicons. And we what we want to really do, the goal really is to bias the PCR to amplifying these semi-target amplicons over the random ones. And so some uh, areas of optimization we can consider after thinking through it this way is we could try to uh, control the tagmentation process itself, such as controlling genomic DNA to transposon ratio and incubation duration. And then we can control the PCR process, uh, the primer design, the primer ratio, annealing temperature, and cycle numbers, you might, as you already know. And so we, we, devel we developed an assay to optimize this tagmentation PCR uh, process. Um, so what, we're, what we do is we follow the standard tagmentation process. Then instead of using a, a normal primer for, the, for, for our target primer, we label that primer with Alexa 647. And so by doing this, what we can see get is then when we run the gel out, uh, we can see, see staying using CyberGold for total DNA amount. But then we can also image in the Sci5 channel to see the actual amount of the primers that's being incorporated into, <clears throat> into these amplicons. And so you can see overlay, this is what they look like. Um, and there's definitely a difference between the Amplicon incorporated uh, uh, the uh, channel compared to the to the uh, cyber go channel, and then what we do is then we do gel quantification, and then we take the 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 ratio of targeted DNA amount to the total DNA amount as our readout, and so first we um, optimize uh, DNA to transponon ratio with the hypothesis that by creating by creating longer fragment lengths, this will encourage DNA uh, target DNA amplification because that those fragments are going to be shorter than the full length amplicons. And then also frag tagmentation time, which is that there's probably an optimum in the, in the number of insertion sites you create, which gets you close enough to your target that um, you, you can successfully create those amplicons, but far enough away that the library isn't just saturated with these transposon sequences. And so we do observe um, an optimum for both of these uh, um, conditions we we choose so we se we selected the eighty nanogram to per microliter transposon condition um, for for this one and then we uh, chose the two minute tagmentation time for the uh, amount of time we spend allowing the tagmentation to occur. So then moving on, we also wanted to optimize the primer ratio as well as cycle number. Um, and our hypothesis there is that with the primer ratio, the higher amount of targeting primers encourage the target amplicon formation and reduces the random amplicon formation. And then the cycle number, um, the theory there is that if we increase the cycles up higher, that the if there is a piece of bias towards our target amplicons, that we that enrichment would just continue to rise. And so if you look at our data, um, it, we see we do see that there is a higher um, enrichment ratio for uh, by adding more primers, but it, it isn't linear. So by adding more target primers, there's at some point you are actually not really enriching any further. So we chose that one to four ratio for our um, for our method. And then um, in terms of the cycle number, it does look like as you increase the number of cycles, the uh, ratio, the fluorescent ratio to DNA ratio does increase as well. But if you actually run these, uh, if you look at the actual gel for these PCRs, you see that the 40 cycle at the 14 cycle and 25 cycle conditions, you see a smooth smear with kind of a bright band around the center. Um, but then like at about the 40 cycle stage, you start to see uh, a number of bands form. And so at some point, um, the PCR kind of changes gears from amplifying all of the amplicons in the pool, fragments in the pool, to amplifying specific uh, ones that seem, just seem to 
amplify faster than the others. And so you so what you want to do is kind of find a happy medium in between uh, the amplification ratio and the uh, and creating and like um, enriching for subsets of the reads. And so um, yeah, and this is something that you actually have to test with uh, with your own your own target primer. <clears throat> okay, so finally, after all of this work, we've created an optimized protocol for tagmentation PCR um, that uses a 80 to 1 transposon complex ratio with 2 minute incubation, 2 minute activation, uh, inactivation, followed by a PCR that uses a 4 to 1 primer ratio and 25 to 35 cycles, depending on your primer. Again, test empirically, and then uh, the ONT protocol for the adaptive ligation and loading. And so let's see how this performs. Um, this is what uh, initial um, PCR uh, tag, nanopore sequencing data looks like on a lot. You can see that across the run, um, you, you get most of your reads at the beginning. And then as the pores start to die, uh, the number of reads you yield tapers out. And in this case, we got about 4.9 gigabases, which is about like a 1.8x coverage of the human genome. Um, we have uh, about, we got, a, we used two barcodes for, for this run, and we had about 452,000 reads that mapped to barcode one and 612,000 reads that map to barcode two. And if you look at the rightmost graph, you can start to see that um, that maybe our optimization was a success in that um, on the, in for barcode one, about 1% 1 of all reads actually map to our um, expected target five prime sequence and about 0.7% of all reads or about 4,300 of them maps to our three prime sequence. So if you, if you tally that up, what we're actually seeing so for the other control genes, such as GINs1 and back beta actin, we, we see about um, an expect, the expected number of reads as before, but for just our insert DNA, we see a dramatic enrichment in the number of reads from uh, the 18 reads from whole genome sequencing to over 9,000 reads in our, in our pool, uh, in our uh, tagmentation PCR sequencing. <clears throat> and we've actually gone on to do this. So, uh, so you can see here um, the comparison of, of uh, whole genome pre-optimized tagmentation PCR uh, nanopore sequencing and optimized tagmentation PCR nanopore sequencing um, for our for line four. And you can see that we actually see um, a 391x enrichment uh, when you normalize by the number of reads uh, in our optimized method compared to just whole genome sequencing itself. And we've gone on to do this method uh, to all of our cell lines. Uh, lines one through six, and we see a consistent number, a fairly consistent number of uh, target reads that from our sequencing from 2000 to one run that actually had up to 16,000 uh, reads amplified. And it doesn't seem to correlate directly, at least from what we're seeing um, with the number, with the, what we would expect the number of integrants in our genome. Um, and so, so this, this has been really interesting. And so now I want to kind of shift gears towards uh, the second question that you might have, which is, uh, okay, now that you have this 9,000 reads, um, what, do you, what do you do with them? Um, so a quick note about long read sequencing data. Uh, most conventional sequencing analysis pipelines use uh, short read nanopore uh, uh, Illumina sequencing. And th these short read Illumina sequencing pipelines make a number of assumptions. Uh, it assumes that the, the short the reads are fairly accurate with about Q30 or 99.9% .9 accuracy, and that the errors are somewhat random, mostly random. And then a lot, and then they, they assume a lot of these short reads from like 50 million yield from MySeq to up to 26 billion read yield from NovaSeq. And they have, a sh and the reads are consistent and short. And that's important because that takes, that determines how much RAM it takes up when you do an alignment. With nanopore long read sequencing, None of the data fits none of these assumptions. The data is only kind of accurate with the R9.4.1 flow cell. Um, what we observe is a Q10 accuracy, so about only 90 to 92 percent. And with our the new the new flow cell chemistry R10, um, we observe about a Q10 to 20 accuracy from 95 to 99 percent accurate. And an important part of that accuracy is that the errors um, generated are systematic. Um, they're, they're, you, they're predictable errors um, and re reproducible errors that uh, particularly for homopolymers, they're greater than three bases and uh, base modifications 
it on the flip side, it is quite robust to complex regions such as juicy rich regions and repetitive regions. And so it's kind of a double edged sword um, because if there are uh, if there are systematic errors, you can't actually use uh, consensus to call the the right answer. But on the on the other hand, eventually there might be a way to develop, develop machine learning model that corrects these errors. Um, these nanopore reads also uh, nanopore runs also generate much fewer reads than Illumina um, for the same base output because the reads are much longer, around five million reads per minion if you're lucky, and uh, depend and it depends heavily on the read length and how you prep your sample before the input, and finally uh, the reads um, have a mean have a mean side length dependent on the prep kit you use. So that, for our method, we get about a five kb fragment and a long tail. Um, of like of uh, reads that might be in hundreds of thousands of bases. So the reason why I mention this is that um, if you're used to analyzing short read sequencing and those those have some of those assumptions, you you do need to um, recon re reconfigure some of your pipeline to be able to handle the the new burden computational burdens from the long read sequencing. And so for our pipeline, uh, what the way we do is we we first do the uh, DNA uh, the data collection and base calling just on a standard desktop C PC with a graphics card a third uh, Nvidia thirty eighty. Um, then what we do is we actually feed the uh, the call, base called fast fast the files, um, in fast Q files into uh, two pipelines. One which uses is Minimap two, which is a tool developed by Hong Lee here at Harvard that um directly that um, is, is designed for uh, nanopore sequencing. And for, with this tool, we map the genomic regions as well as large insert features. And then we do our own uh, um, Smith-Waterman local alignment um, for calling barcodes and small insert features um, to get a more granular view of the results. We then um, take these uh, annotated reads and we do read clustering based on those annotations and we call a consensus. Um, sequence to to correct for the errors and the, uh, sequencing errors, and then finally we uh, we validate the integration sites through junction PCR and Sanger sequence. Okay, so um, one kind of interesting thing about like kind of both a bug and a feature about our sequencing method is that only one percent of your your reads end up being targeted reads. So about ninety nine percent of your sequencing data is actually still whole genome sequencing. So kind of a fun thing you can get. Um, when you're characterizing rising cell lines and you get whole genome sequencing data, is that you can look at its carrier, like a pseudo carrier type, by simply mapping how the reads map to the genome itself. And so the cell line we're using, it's called K562. And um, it is a leukemia cell line that has it's a, a pseudo triploid. And you can see that its genome is quite messy. And um, so I've overlaid uh, a visualization of that mapping with a published paper on um, on the you're doing an mfish of the of the K562 genome, and um, you can see that uh, some expected regions uh, that are triploid, we also see are triploid by the counting, and some regions that are du diploid, we see diploid by the counting as well. Um, but then some interesting regions uh, that we can see in chromosome one, we see an extra uh, tetraploid region, which is this little piece all, all the way on the right. And in chromosome five, um, the little bit from the karyotype is actually the, the, the first part of that genome. Um, and then if, if we look at our um, lines compared to the wild type genome, we actually can see in some cases uh, clonal uh, structural changes such as a clonal deletion in uh, line one, uh, in our the, the first one of our first, um, our line number one. Okay, so uh, what do these on-target um, what what do these targeted reads look like? So let's look at line one, which we um, which, for which we only observe on the on-target integration into the AVS one site in the genome. So the five prime empicons look like this, and so if you annotate them, there's a region that maps to your insert DNA in this case, pure myosin resistance gene, and then the five prime homology arm, which is the br the brown, and then the black indicates uh, on genomic DNA that we did not um, introduce into the cell ourselves uh, mapping to chromosome 19. And that's, so that's the five prime amplicons. We also did this for the three prime amplicon. And in this case, we see uh, an M cherry gene mapping to our insert as, as well as the SV40 terminator, followed by a three prime homology arm, 
and then uh, chromosome and then uh, unknown sequ sequences that are not part of what we deliver to the cell that maps to the chromosome 19 gene. So in this case, uh, this is a really successful the constructed cell line, which has only on target integrations. Um, but that's not the case with all of our lines. So for instance, with the line six, we observe the on target amplicons as before. But then we also observe off-target amplicons in chromosome six, in which case they look like this. So the five prime region, um, we still see the pyromycin resistance, which is where we prime. So it's go always going to be there, but we observe a truncated five prime homology arm followed by a chromosome six genome DNA. And on the three prime end, we see our MGRE SV40 terminator and the three prime homology arm as before, but then we observe our plasmid backbone. So the yellow indicates the origin of replication and the green indicates ampicillin uh, resistance, and then followed by a little piece of five prime homology arm, and then the uh, chromosome six uh, DNA. So this indicates that for for line six, uh, the 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 line building was a little messier, and we were we actually have integrated plasma DNA into the human genome itself as well. And we believe that this is likely something that happens naturally with all um, Cas9. Um, double-stranded break-based uh, homology repair um, delivery. And so um, we're still uh, finalizing our analysis of some of this data, but some preliminary findings is that um, almost all, but not all of the lines we've constructed have this on-target integration after uh, this RNP donor DNA co-delivery and selection, which indicates that this kind of concept of the promoterless plural selection design from the Mali et al., which is a church lab, paper works, um, but doesn't, it's not, it's not hundred percent perfect. We see that um, our on-target integrations regions tend to be perfect, leading to, to us uh, believing that, that, you know, homologous repair machinery is being activated for these integrations. But interestingly, our off-target integrations tends to be somewhat messy um, and demonstrate a concatenation of multiple DNAs and presence of plasmid backbones. And so we believe that the mechanism for these integrations are likely a chain of sequential non-homologous end joining events, or even micro-homology mediated end joining events. And so um, we looked in the literature to see if other people have reported this. And actually very few people, papers describe off-target integrations in this level of detail. But there was one um, by Remy et al. in Genome Res in 2014 that describes a similar observation of concatenator formation and plasmid DNA insertion uh, after zinc finger, tau, and cast line uh, delivery. OK, so wrapping up the talk, um, our wish list was something that, a method that was easy, affordable, and provided long reads. Um, this method I described today only require you to bring one additional component, your target primer, in addition to the, just buying the Oscar Nano 4 rapid PCR barcoding kit, and only requires about 20 minutes of hands-on time to do the entire process. Um, it is re relatively affordable. With a single flow cell about, costing about $700, you can get um, a high coverage up to 9,000 9, X of that region. And so with that many, that much coverage, you can easily multiplex it to up to 24 different samples without even designing or using your own barcodes by just using barcodes that the kit provides. And then it, this provides long reads um, in our hands, again, about 5,000 bases um, on average for each read. And so if, you, if we um, scale this to the highest and lowest end of the scale with a single sample per flow cell, um, per, you, you can get a theoretical output based on their nanopore reported reported amount of yield of about 55,000 target reads for $770. And on the other end, if you use all 24 barcodes, you can get up still up to 1,875 targeted reads with a cost per sample of about $32. And so if you look at the type of applications you might wanna use this for, repetitive element mapping, transposon viral insertions, double-stranded break mediated homologous repair, and site-specific recombinase insertions, you can start to scale how many insertions you expect to see and then scale up from there to see how many reads you might want to get per insertion and then figure out how many samples you can uh, multiplex onto a single flow cell. And theoretically for very highly efficient um, integration methods such as landing pads or, su or a pseudocyte recombinases, um, you, may you may only use this method for very high throughput screening of like hundreds of cell lines that you're building, in which case you might be able to scale up to 150 samples into a single flow cell, lowering your sequencing costs per sample to just only $5. Okay, 
So in summary, we've developed uh, traditional methods to integrate um, integration locations on genomes either difficult, expensive, or has low sensitivity. But by combining these two really exciting technologies, tag mutation, PCR, and nanopore sequencing, you can yield thousands of semi-targeted reads per run with very minimal amount of changes to the protocol. And um, by uh, and by because this there's so much uh, such a high enrichment and long reads, this leads to the yield of high quality high quality characterization of many sites on a single cell line or multiple lines. A simultaneous characterization of multiple lines using a single flow cell. Okay, so with that, I want to conclude and thank um, Dr. Church for uh, hosting me and allowing me to do this work and explore my interest and um, have a lot of fun. I want to thank all my collaborators, Esther, Claire, and Lilia, who are all graduate students right now. Um, I want to thank the people in my lab, um, Emma, Christine, and Nicole, uh, as well as the core facility for helping me build my cell lines. Um, all Most of the figures made in this uh, Talk are made with BioRender, and the, we were funded by the DARPA Engineered Living Materials Grant. Um, and before I start to take questions, um, I just want to, I have a little QR code here. If you want to try this out yourself with your own nanopore sequencing flow cells, um, you can follow my protocol on the top right. And I'm looking for next steps after we finish submitting this paper. And so if you have any thoughts on that, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Thanks so much. Absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you. You know what? I only slept three and a half hours. You wake me up. So fantastic. <laughs> so Ferran, do you have any comment or question? Yeah, I'm eager to try this in my lab. I just yeah. clicked on your QR code. Um, nice. And I assume um, that this is agnostic to any genome, right? Because we're playing with everything from bacteria to yeast to some mammalian cell lines. Um, one question I have is to what extent have you pushed your multiplexing? So you mentioned 24. That's a really good question. How, what do you like, how, yeah, how much do you think you could push that? Because I think I could see a lot of value in either pooling a number of different like cell lines or clones or if you're doing pretty sort of extreme genome engineering, being able to just access as many like long regions as possible. So maybe you just comment on what you think the current limitations are now. And I'm sure you guys are talking about pushing it. Mm -hmm. So um, the more, so I think um, I'm going to start a step back, which is if you're not in the church lab, you might ask, why are you trying to multiplex so many? Just do a single sample per flow cell. I get it. The answer for the audience who is not Church Lab is that it's always a numbers game, right? You always have a cap. So for that same cap, if you can do 10 samples on a single flow cell, then you just do 10 times more samples. Um, and so you can just get higher quality data, better build cell lines, et cetera. Um, so what is the limit to the number, the amount of multiplexing? So uh, the theoretical limit is really high, right? Because um, on a Illumina short read sequencing platform, each base of your barcode takes away your actual sequencing. So like that really limits your barcode size. Whereas as I mentioned, the reads we're getting is about 5,000 bases each. You can see on that, right? Like that is like, it's 1,600 bases, about 1,000 which maps to my insert and about 600 which maps to the genome itself. You have so much more space to play with with these long read sequencing. So on that end, um, if you are doing your own barcode creation, uh, that I, I think the sky is kind of the limit. Um, you have so much more space to play with. Um, but on the up, on the flip side, as I mentioned, now for sequencing is still relatively inaccurate, uh, about 95% yeah. uh, on a good day. Yeah. Uh, and then 99% on a really good day using the R10 with perfect prep. Um, and that's, 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 you know, hands, not, not anything I can write in the protocol. And so um, with that kind of accuracy, uh, you get a lot of miscalled bar, or just, mi I would say missed barcodes, because you should be designing barcodes that cannot be miscalled, right? You should, they should, they should only be missed. And we, we do see that, and we have a the tertiary pipeline, which analyzes the entire data set, ignoring barcodes. But if you're, but if you're gonna multiplex, you need to use barcodes as your primary filtering. Otherwise you're mixing samples, right? And so for, in terms of that, um, I do, I think um, we, what we're seeing is we're missing about like 10 to 20% of the calls on the barcodes, which matches with the error rate. 
And so like, if you're just gonna use the 24 on there, um, I think I think 24 should be reasonably um, robust in terms of uh, being able to tell between uh, what reads. Uh, but I think you, you either need to provide better barcodes of your own or um, then of course, accuracy needs to improve. And what's interesting is that that can kind of happen both on a wetware side of like um, just improving the pour. Although like if they move to another version like R11, that would just be a nightmare because then everyone has to throw away all of their flow cells. Um, or or it can happen on computational side. Like I mentioned, a lot of these errors are systematic, right? They, they're, they're there not because of any, not only just because of data problems, but also because there's methylations or modifications to the nucleotides or like, or repeats. And so those, there should be ways to build um, neural networks that are gonna help filter and better process that sequencing data. And so I think there, there's a future when that's within the next year or two, maybe even, where like it, it, you see a significant increase in the accuracy. And then that would also allow you to just do better barcodes within a short time, sure. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks. One one related question to that, then I'm opening to others. Is sure. I like I like how you get the the rest of the genome for free. Um, yeah, I like I that spin. Yeah. What was the coverage that you were able to get in in, in the rest of that genome? So, um, I, are you asking about bias, or what? Can you? No. So. Right. I mean, it, it actually is related to the points you were just making about, you know, error in in <clears throat> Oxford nanopore sequencing, right? Yeah. Like to get really good calls here, right? You need a minimum yeah. amount of coverage. One of the biggest challenges, right, with whole yeah. genome sequencing mammalian yeah. genomes is getting yeah. enough coverage. Yeah, for and sure. And that's gonna be compounded with Oxford nanopore, where the right. sequencing relative to let's say Illumina is considerably yeah. worse. Well, so ironically, I think Oxford now long resequencing is actually much better for genomic coverage because it's so long. So the errors are um, are kind of filtered out by just it, there. Nobody else matches this five KB fragment, and so you know, uh, especially for repetitive region mapping, you know, like we are not really saying the human genome has you know fragments of repetition that are like over 10,000 bases long, identical, like five to 10,000 bases, right? They're really repetitive within the window of 50 to 100 bases at most. And so like these 5,000 base pair reads can fairly accurately map most of the reads, even with errors. And so um, this this example, it's really uh, a nice, uh, this one is at about uh, 6X human genome coverage, so about 20 gigabases. And then you can see that like the mapping across the genome in general is quite consistent and smooth and normalizes the right numbers. And so this there's an additional element of this, which is that we believe that this um, technician PCR method mostly stays within linear amplification range of that PCR, even when we push it a bit, because you don't really see dramatic, dramatic bias within large frag parts of the genome. And then, um, but within, within our own like single flow cell runs so like this one the the line is uh, 1x coverage and that blue line that gray line is 6x coverage you see a lot more variability right the lines are more jagged across the genome um but but in but like that this isn't our goal and you know this i don't think would be the goal of this method is not to you know map the genome necessarily it's just kind of a nice yeah. sanity check but really the goal is to find integration sites for this method that's great. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any other question or comment? If not, I want to follow up, you know, with the, your wonderful question. So of the first question. So yeah. I'm not the sequencing guy. So, but the only thing I care about in terms of sequencing is my student postdoc, you know, charge me a lot every single week. Yeah. Uh, especially the Sanger sequencing and also the, some genome sequencing as well. Uh, yeah. My question is, actually, I had the interview uh, recently with somebody, and then the, they asked, you know, about the, uh, you know, information storage in DNA. And then I pretend I know things <laughs> about that donor, but, but I do not know anything because I'm not expert. My question is, you know, we also already discussed, we pushed the limit, but... I just want to know 
what is really the physical chemistry biology limit to achieve whatever you know perfect 99.99% accuracy and uh you know the whatever you know chip you know sequencing in the future not necessarily using the current technology nanopore sequencing or whatever technology we currently have but what would be real limit at the end of the day in that way i could use dna real storage you know vehicle or the device in that way i could retrieve whatever book george church lot or whatever the database you know we store in that you know place in the future yeah. so that's a really uh interesting philosophical question yeah. um and i'm not an expert either although i would say george george church is um, You're better than me actually and you know like henry and nilly who started coldervarium really uh they henry really focused on this dna storage idea so I'm going to just use some of what I've heard from him in the lab meeting talks uh, to answer your question. But really, you should read some of the work he's, he's published, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think in general, um, DNA has four bases, whereas, you know, um, or just within conventional DNA bearing, you guys have six or 10. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, with just regular, you know, ATGC or a base pairing, <laughs> um, you, you don't necessarily need that high level information density. Whereas, you know, with like a disk plat platter, you have just binary on zeros or ones. So if you, even if you go to a tertiary bit, ba uh, three bit, ba uh, three tri trinary based method to do, to do the encoding, you, you still can encode really dense amount of information. And then you keep the last, uh, base as kind of, a um, like a, like a quality control or a check or a redundancy kind of uh, thing. And so that's, um, I think in terms of like pure density, there's they've they've kind of answered some of that in that regard. Now I think the the other component of DNA storage is really like what are you storing and how quickly do you want to get it back? Right. So like yeah. there's not any point in storing information if you can't retrieve it when you need it. Right. And that's yeah. like I would say one of the biggest challenges to, you know, if you think about AWS, really large data is uh like how can you rapidly retrieve the subset of data you need at just in time exactly when you need it. And, you know, yeah. interestingly, even though I don't want to be limited by current technology, as you said, Nanopore brings that uh, DNA storage concept a lot more to reality than, you know, Illumina or Zanger sequencing, just in the sense that it you can do base calls uh, in real time, right, in single molecule formats. And so, like, let's say that you've stored the, like, in t the new like an entire movie, you know, into like Gattaca into mm -hmm. DNA and you want to watch the movie, right? Um, you don't necessarily want to finish sequencing the in re, re like unencode the entirety of that storage to watch that movie in immediately, right? You might, you want, you just need to re unencode the first part of the movie to even watch it at all. And so with nanopore sequencing, that might even be something you can that might be feasible that you know you 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 just collect the first piece of the movie and start reading it and then you you collect the second piece of the you you bring the second piece you you like create tracks and you you pull those tracks down into your pores and sequence those as you're watching the movie and then so you you see you are sequencing and as as you're finishing the movie the thing is still sequencing but you're you're getting the information you need back out of it so I think. In that sense, we really are moving closer to real time storage and a reading, a reading and writing of, of the DNA, as Farron kind of mentioned earlier, too. Something he's interested in. Okay, thank you. So that means, I mean, within my time in this war, I could use DNA, you know, click the whatever device I can watch the movie that store. Uh, I, don't think that's the, I don't think that's the craziest idea. No. Okay, wonderful. I love it. Thank you. Uh, because we now passed the 20, 30, 30 minutes after 11 my time, I probably need to close officially and then we may chat more if you have time. Okay. So thank you all for joining and staying today. Uh, we'll meet again on April 11, oh, already, uh, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have the Professor Pablo Nickel the chief editor of current opinion in biotechnology at DTU, Denmark. 
and Professor Quentin Dudley at the University of Minnesota of the Wisconsin Madison. As usual, the follow informal chat will occur with our recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us. We will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty faces if you wish. Uh, thanks. I'm stop recording. Okay, one second.